In a deep voice, I announce myself as Tibia, a skeleton knight, and that I challenge them to an honourable combat. The sound of feet shuffling behind me stopped. Just as the three men likewise halted their approach, they seemed to whisper between themselves, giving me a good chance to see who I was facing. Two of them were typical players, one clearly a thief, while the other a sword and shield fighter. The third was wearing armour beneath a white surcoat that I recognised, him belonging to a gang of warriors Ulsic had procured. He had a small shield and sword, both of them much better quality than the ones his ally carried. They finished their discussion rather quickly, and the man in the white surcoat stepped forward, announcing in tones I could fairly call Horde. As he accepted my challenge despite me being unworthy of his time, I was nervous. The last battle I had against one of these guys started to replay in my memory, crushing any good feelings I had been starting to regain from my recent victories against the players I had fought with the new group of people. My opponent seemed confident, his shield prepared in front of him, his eyes focused on me. I approached cautiously, but he wasn't going to let any more tension build up. He rushed forward faster than I expected, but I was still able to maintain my distance and flash out with one of my swords. He blocked it easily with his shield, ready to press the attack, but I had learned enough from his friend that I had to keep attacking to teach him to keep his distance. I swung my swords without finesse, simply trying to move them as fast as I could, with most of my strikes being blocked by his shield, but enough of them being near misses, forcing him to retreat backwards. With distance between us again, he called out to me, asking if I played the character named Nephim. I replied without the deep voice, telling him I was. With a grin that bordered on a sneer, he said that he and some of his friends were going to have fun tomorrow hunting me, and that this would be a prelude to what was going to happen. I didn't bother to reply, my mind too focused on the battle. We had only exchanged a few blows, but I could tell he wasn't as strong as the other members of his gang that I had fought with. By my estimate, he wasn't even on Ren's level which gave me some hope. While I would have preferred a two-handed sword, I at least felt that I was good enough with two swords not to be able to use them as an excuse if I lost. He moved forward again, but he moved with less confidence, not rushing to attack as eagerly as he had before. I kept a little distance between us, realising that his movements were very atypical, not at all like the way other people at the LARP positioned themselves. As I shifted to the side, He was slow in turning, and I saw that his feet were positioned like a fencer's, his left behind him and pointing out to the side, an odd stance to use with a shield, since while he was well protected with his shield in his right hand, he couldn't attack very well with his sword behind him in his left. While this stance may have worked against novices, I wasn't the kind of person who'd get hit by a sword work that required him to change his entire stance just to reach me. Moving forward, I lashed out at him, again and again, and without having to worry about counter-attacks, I was able to land several strikes on him. Just as I started to feel like the battle was won, he punched me out with his right arm, his shield crumpling one of my arms before slamming into my chest, tossing me backwards. While the shield had his edges covered in a thin, dense foam, the face of it was just painted wood, and after playing around with foam weapons all day, it felt like getting hit by a hammer. We both know it was an illegal strike, something that might be permitted at his historical combat society, and that he had instinctively performed. He eyed me for a moment, seeing how I would react, his face expressionless, with the shock and the pain of the blow being washed away by a surge of adrenaline. I chose to ignore what must have been a mistake, and move forward to resume my attack. After blocking my sword in a shield, he once again punched out with it, catching me by surprise again. This time, He followed with his sword, striking me for six points of damage before I had the chance to recover. This must have been a style he had mastered at his society. And while part of me wanted to call him out as a cheater, another part of me was growing excited at the prospect of fighting a new type of opponent. His two allies had gasped loudly, but neither of them seemed willing to say anything about the legal attacks. And I wasn't even sure if the goth girl knew that what he was doing would ordinarily be enough to have him kicked out of this LARP. He advanced towards me again, his shield leading the way. Even though I was expecting it, he simply pressed forward with his shield, 
impossible for me to block with the flimsy foam and PVC pipe swords I had. It was no wonder he had adopted this style as his own, as it was ridiculously effective. His shield preventing me from coming close, and then delivering painful blows that would let his sword sink in. Before I could figure anything out, I was down to my last three health points, and I hadn't landed a single blow since he had adopted a shield bashing strategy. Thinking hard, I realised he was also breaking another rule. Though, it was one that most people, at least the ones who came here to fight, ignored, myself included. He was charging, or moving forward after he had come within five feet or so of me. Charging was prohibited as a safety concern, to prevent people from colliding into each other, but it also made most battles a silly display of two people just standing within sword range of each other, and just flailing until the damage accumulated enough to drop one of them. Both of us had been charging at each other, but now he was the only one on the offensive. Moving backwards as quickly as I could, I forced him to run after me, his shield leading the way, trying to get close enough to slam it into me. As he caught up and pulled his shield back in preparation, I stopped suddenly, turning to the side in a low crouch. The bottom of his shield slammed into my back awkwardly, thrusting upwards into himself as his legs collided with me. He tripped spectacularly, falling over me and landing in a crumpled pile. Cautiously, I asked if he was alright, and he groaned an I'm okay, checking to see that all the witnesses had heard, and not feeling obligated to be any more courteous. I delivered several strikes to him as he began to stand, after which he simply lay down again. I turned to the two remaining players, my body aching slightly, hoping and praying that they would just run for help. They seemed confused and I almost thought that the thief was about to try and reprimand me for what I had just done. The fighter, however, seemed to understand that what he had just seen was not something that was tied to the rules of this LARP. Without a word, he started to head towards the inn, his friend soon following him. Staring down at my fallen opponent, I wondered for a moment whether it was worth trying to talk to him, to ask what his plans were, what methods they were going to use, and why they were doing everything to begin with. There were so many questions I wanted to ask that they'll all be blurred together until a wave of pain hit me. I had taken a lot more damage than I had thought from this single battle and it might have been that I harboured some resentment towards him or it might have been that I just didn't feel like putting in the energy to question him. I left. The shuffling girl followed behind me. I headed back towards the cave, surprised at my fatigue. Thankfully, there were still a few more hours left in the night. A little more time where I could remain as a monster without having to worry about being hunted by Ulsic's gang. The girl seemed likewise tired, and though I'm sure she must have been disappointed that she didn't get a chance to fight once while the two of us had been out, she hid it well. After I slumped into one of the couches in the cave, she said she was going to head back to the inn to her friends. Once she had left, Hargel and Lith, who had both been lazily reclining inside the cave, started to question me about her while making vague implications. I cut their questioning story short by asking them whether they had any plans to keep House Cerberus from being completely destroyed, and Harjo muttered that hiding had worked last time for him, so he thought he'd tried again. I told them of my encounter with the man in the white surcoat, and they wondered if this man I had described had actually been one of the seven we were supposed to look out for, since neither of them remembered any of them that well. Dismissing my story, Lith explained how he and Hargel had asked to be powerful monsters so that they could go out tonight and kill some of them, but they had been flatly refused. They instead went out as murder grunks, weak little rat people, and had been repeatedly beaten by groups of six or more players. While Lith told me about his adventures, Vlain arrived, and I realised just how much I had grown to depend on him. He immediately began telling me information he had gathered, including ideas he wasn't sure about but sounded plausible to me. To start, he had gathered a lot of information about the seven people Ulsic had brought to this LARP. Though it was mostly rumour, Flynn said that only four of them were really exceptional fighters, while the other three were just about average, and had already been defeated by some of the people playing monsters, which included the guy I had been so proud to have defeated. However, however, all of them were part of a patrolling system which covered the entire grounds, and were being assisted by several other players. They were organised, with all information leading back to Ulsic. Vlain and most of the players had no idea where Ulsic was. 
He had made a few appearances, but kept disappearing to some place. He said that Rand was out currently trying to see if he could find Ulsic by chance and follow him to wherever he was hiding, but he hadn't had any luck so far. Since my ultimate goal involved making sure that Ulsic died so hard that he wouldn't even want to come back, I was certain that we'd need to find his hiding spot eventually in order to get through this weekend. When I asked Flynn about Ulsic's lichhood, he had no information at all. My biggest fear was that he had a phylactery that needed to be destroyed in order to kill him, and I also wanted to know whether he had a new abilities that no one knew about. Worried slightly, I pressed on with my questions, asking what the players thought about Ulsic's return. There were varying shades of opinion. There was a small group that couldn't be happier about his resurrection, though this was definitely a minority, composed of sycophants and people Ulsic had bribed with power and favours. Most of the players had characters that acted pleased and would side with him if there were any conflict, but in reality, they had correctly assessed that Ulsic was simply taking his character's death in the worst manner possible. Many of these people had come to terms with the permanent deaths of their own previous characters and felt somewhat miffed that Ulsic was unwilling to accept his. Yet, there was a small group, perhaps only sparse individuals, who knew that something was horribly, terribly wrong and that trusting a lich, even if he was a good lich, would be disastrous. This sadly was an unpopular opinion that had only been confided privately to Vlain, but it was still good to hear that there were some players who weren't going to blindly follow the plot that Ulsic had written. Many of the players felt intimidated by the ones Ulsic had brought in, and while Ulsic, even as a lich, was in good standing with the other players, his little squad was openly disliked by everyone except all six sycophants. They were reputed to be arrogant and to be rather brutal with their fighting, which I felt was fair assessment, and their gear and stats were definitely unfair. Flynn continued to talk while I was deep in thought, trying to piece together something that resembled a strategy. There had to be some opportunity, some overlooked detail, Something that could lead to Ulsic's defeat and the return of House Cerberus to greater glory than it had ever started with. Closing my eyes, I began to list what needed to be done. While I tried, I realised that I had never truly determined what was more important to me. Killing Ulsic or restoring the house. I had simply lumped them together. Though I came to realise that there were important choices that needed to be made. In order to restore House Cerberus, Harjal and Lith needed to remain alive. Could they be asked to fight Ulsic if it meant risking the existence of their noble house? Did we have a chance to defeat him without their help? The reason I had decided to come to the LARP had almost solely been just to have a chance to truly kill Ulsic, thinking that saving House Cerberus would be a nice added bonus. As my mind poured over the details, I realised there was a good chance that trying to kill him would actually lead to the end of the house. But what other options were there? Leaving him alone? Having Harjal hide until Ulsic finally grew tired of trying to kill him, keeping the house alive in name only. Perhaps he and Lith could recruit people secretly, creating a hidden society that would eventually undermine Ulsic. They could take their time, going to events and only playing as monsters, recruiting people out of game and only re-emerging once they had enough strength and information to be certain of their victory. Ulsic, though he would be deluded into thinking he had won, would eventually be overthrown. I stopped myself. I was running away again. If Ulsic forced them into hiding, that would be a victory in itself. As I zoned in and out of listening to Vlain, I confirmed with myself what was necessary. Ulsic needed to be defeated, but either Harjal or Lith also needed to survive. These were two goals that had to be maintained. Ulsic's squad of fighters, along with his other supporters, did not need to be destroyed. If we could avoid them and strike solely at Ulsic, we might stand a chance, except for the problem that it had taken a small army to deplete all of Ulsic's spells the first time we had defeated him, and sneaking a small army past Ulsic's defenders wouldn't be easy, if at all possible. I knew I was thinking too much. I couldn't help it. My mind was trying its hardest to figure out how we even stood a chance against Ulsic, while I knew I should have been trying to figure out just how to survive the next two days. After Vlain finished telling me all he had learned, I decided to head out again as a monster. If luck was with me, I'd be able to figure something out while I was out. Lith came with me, Hargil and Vlain being too tired to go out again. We were assigned to be bog trolls again, 
and I was glad to have the chance to use a two-handed sword again. Lith chose a long spear, since trolls could not use shields, and we went out, without any real direction. We stayed together, ignoring that bog trolls were supposed to be solitary, and after only about five minutes, I heard someone calling me. It was the old man who had travelled with me and the girls, who seemed to have forgotten that as he was a player now, and I was still a monster, I was supposed to try and kill him. Lith seemed intent on reminding him, but I greeted the man out of character, and he was soon followed by a man who looked slightly younger than I was. The man greeted us, and introduced himself as the old man's grandson. He thanked me for looking after his grandfather, and for getting him out of monster duty early. I received a rather different impression from him than I had been expecting from a guy who had left his grandfather alone at LARP. I explained that we needed to get back to being monsters, and Lith and I headed off again. We encountered a few players, though neither Lith nor I seemed intent on chasing after them. There was a somewhat melancholy feel to the air, and I started to wonder why we had bothered to go out. There was the crunch of a twig and the slight jingle of meal armour. Turning around, I saw two people, both that I remembered quite well. It was the hammer-wielding plated warrior, and standing next to him was a shorter, miserable-looking man I was very much not pleased to see. It was the man I had killed twice at the last event I had been to, and his face contorted with rage when he realised who I was. The rage passed quickly, and with a smile pointed to the two of us, with the air of someone ordering a dog, he told his ally to kill us. The plated warrior looked reluctant to follow what sounded like an order, but he didn't seem reluctant to fight us. Lith looked nervous, but I at least knew this would be a two-on-one battle since the man I killed before couldn't even be called a distraction. I moved to flank the warrior with Lith, who didn't look too comfortable without a shield. Before Lith got into position, the man swung his hammer, and I saw that the pole it was attached to was longer than even Lith's spear. He struck Lith hard, calling out 10 points of damage, and with a slight flick struck him again for another 10. With Lith under half his health in only the first few seconds, I realised why this man was considered one of the four strong members. While he tried to strike at the retreating Lith again, I circled towards his back. I slashed with my sword, expecting him to be unable to do anything from his position. The butt of his pole arm struck me hard in the gut. While it was padded, it had hit me with an unexpected force, and I nearly crumpled to the ground from it as he called out 10 damage. I moved backwards away from him and was hit in the back by the man I had chosen to ignore, him dealing me with another 12 damage just from that single hit. With only 13 health points left, I didn't even bother to listen to him gloat. Moving out of both of their reaches and heading back towards Lith, Lith was having a hard time, not used to wielding a spear while his opponent had not only better reach but more experience. He fell after two more hits, leaving me alone against the two. Under equal circumstances, I might have had a chance against the plated warrior. He knew what he was doing, but the tip of his weapon was heavy. Heavy enough that I had a decisive advantage in speed, even though he had longer reach. He actually shortened his grip to try and keep up with me, but it didn't take me long to see that he was just fighting defensively, letting his alley get into position. Choosing the shame of death instead of running just so that I had a chance to land a hit on him. I fell quickly, as soon as he caught and pressed my sword with his hammer allowing the man I killed to freely carve up my back. Once again, I wasn't checked for any coins, our opponents probably having weapons and gear better than money could purchase. I ignore the man who was gloating and boasting, turning my head to look at the plated warrior. He looked disappointed, but not at me, but his ally. They left eventually, and me and Lith slowly got up. He began to curse about overpowered characters, but I didn't encourage him to continue, so he eventually became silent. While this defeat was rather humiliating, I was feeling surprisingly optimistic. Though I hadn't landed any hit on my foe, he only landed one himself, and I knew that I could at the very least keep up with him. Though I admit he had defeated not only me, but Lith as well, and rather quickly, I didn't feel as crushed as I had before. I knew I was being stupidly proud, looking for pride within defeat, but something in me wasn't allowing me to feel depressed. He might have had more skill than me, or even Rand, but he wasn't as skilled as the one in the black scaled armour. I couldn't keep obsessing over my losses, or I'd end up simply giving up hope. 
After we returned to the cave and ended our monster shifts, we were both almost too tired to make it all the way to our sign cabins, almost nodding off on our way there. Harjo was asleep inside when we arrived, and I restrained Lith from waking him up. After we got ready, Lith fell asleep almost instantly, while I remained awake despite how tired I felt. These were the last few hours before I would don the costume of Neff and Festiva. Ulsic had a grudge against me as deep as the one I had against him, and I knew he'd do anything to try and kill me. While I had managed to evade a fair amount of players, albeit disorganised ones, during the last event, this time I wasn't the only one who had avoided being caught. My great fear was that I went out and hid alone. Hargill and Lith would be caught, ending our plans right there. I had a feeling Hargill had only survived the last event because Ulsic wanted to kill him last, and Hargill only had to be killed once and he would permanently be dead. Wondering just what exactly I could do to keep my friends alive, when I didn't even know if I could keep myself alive, I drifted into an uneasy sleep, my body aching from the shield bashes I had received earlier. I needed to get rested, as tomorrow was shaping up to be a very exhausting day. I awoke early, a little after six, and it took me a moment to remember everything. I was surprised to discover that I was a bit sore from the day before, but there wasn't any serious pain. I woke up Lith, who grudgingly got up and tried to rouse Hargill, who seemed intent on having a lion. When I reminded him that all our enemies knew where we were and were probably going to kill us if we stayed any longer, he sleepily started to get dressed. My costume had improved a bit from the last time I had been here. My clothes were chosen to help me blend in with the trees and ground, with a broken pattern to help break up my form, but it was still medieval enough to pass as a costume here. Slipping on a baldric over my shoulder and hanging my canteen on it, I then slipped my two-handed sword through the loop on the back, which added a snap button for quick removal. I then put on the one magic item I had. It was a cheap plastic ring, painted gold with a plastic blue gem, but it was something exceedingly powerful in this LARP. A ring of minor spell reflection allowed me to block oncoming spells with a sword or shield, which usually still counted as targets for spells. I had unwittingly taken it while it was intended for one of all six lackeys, and I'd gotten good use out of it when I fought to kill him. When I finished grabbing a few energy bars, Flynn rushed into our cabin, not bothering to knock and catching Hargill in nothing but his boxers. Flynn ignored his protests, eager to tell me that he had both good news and bad news. The good news was that he knew a way for us to survive the day without encountering any of our enemies. We would go on quests. It was such a simple yet brilliant solution and I only excused myself for not coming up with it because I wasn't too familiar with the LARP. Quests here were handled very simply, with players either putting in requests at the cave and then being led off on a crafted adventure, or waiting until an NPC arrived at the inn and gave them a quest. The brilliant part was that the quest took place in a distant land, which meant that if you were on a quest, other people were to pretend you didn't exist and try not to get in your way. With the quest tailored to the level of the participants, there was almost no chance that Hargill or Lith would die while we were on a quest. While it wasn't really a solution to our problems, it at least gave us time for an opportunity to appear before we were hunted and killed by Ulsic's gang. As he promised to meet us in particular part of the grounds as an NPC to send us on a quest, I was once again glad that Flynn was our ally. Before he left, I asked him what the bad news was. Hesitating, he answered that some of the seven, he did not know which, had their monster duties today. While going on a quest meant we wouldn't be hunted by the remainder, it also meant that there was a good chance we'd meet some of them as monsters on our quest. Having to face one of them when they didn't have to care about dying, and we did, was an excellent example of bad news. He asked me if going on a quest was still a good idea, and I stopped to think for a moment. In the end, I decided it would be better for us to try and survive the quests than for the three of us to try and hide for the entire day. If things worked out, we could possibly even try and get some good treasure. Something to help match the ridiculous power we were going to have to face. When Lith and Hargill were finally ready, we set off for the part of the forest where Vlian had instructed. Having Hargill and Lith survive the day was our most important goal right now, but I couldn't help but wonder if we were heading towards an adventure we weren't going to be able to handle. Pushing aside my worries, I launched into a run, my sword bobbing gently against my back. 
end of part one. Well, it's actually like end of part four at this point, but you know. Well, still. <laughs>